Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 82, I chat with Derek Smith, co-founder and CTO of SpectraCal, about video calibration and the future of home video. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded October 10th, 2011, episode 82 Calibrating with SpectraCal. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies streamed directly to your PC, Mac, or TV instantly. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, online editor of hometheater.com. This week's guest geek is Derek Smith, uh, CTO and co-founder of SpectraCal, uh, one of the premier companies involved in video calibration. So we're going to have a real geek fest today. Hey, Derek, welcome to the show. Thanks for inviting me. I'm glad to be on the show today. You bet. Uh, those who are tuned into the live video stream at live.twit.tv or in the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions for Derek. Uh, I'll be watching the chat room here, and uh, I will be uh, passing along as many of those questions as I can. So uh, today, of course, is about video and about video calibration. And SpectraCal's primary product in that regard is a software suite called CalMan. Uh, Derek, uh, tell us a little bit about how and why you came up with CalMan, where it is now, and where it's going. Well, CalMan came about um, from the original concept to be able to provide software for enthusiasts. Uh, my background primarily has been in software engineering and then also in audio for speaker design amps crossovers for many years starting in the 80s. I built myself a home theater um, about 10 years ago, installed all the speakers that I designed, installed a projector, and found that either the tools were very expensive or very limited. And so with my software background, uh, brought in one of my other partners, L.A. Heberline, from a previous company that we'd owned and started developing the first versions of CalMan uh, back in 2006. And its original intent was, again, for the enthusiast market. Um, as, a, for, as opposed to the professional calibrator, calibrator market, right? Yeah, because um, there was two established products in the, in the pro market, and so we, we didn't figure that we really had a chance of competing with the pro market, but we knew we had a really good chance of uh, providing products for essentially the DIY or the enthusiast. Um, so we developed that, and that was essentially um, CalMan version 1 and version 2, which mm -hmm. were based on Excel spreadsheets, um, to where you either had to type in the data or in uh, CalMan version 2, we had the ability to talk to some of the lower-end meters and be able to bring the data in. Um, well, now that, bring, that brings up an interesting side point here. You, you mentioned lower-end meters. Now, meters, which are the instruments uh, that, that you use to uh, measure the uh, color and the l amount of light and so on that come off of a screen uh, are generally not cheap, even the low-end ones. Um, they're the, the cheaper ones, what we consider the low-end ones, are about $200 today. Um, and they go anywhere from $200 for the professional up to probably in the mid-teens, probably fourteen to 15000 and then all the way up to forty or 50000 for the research-grade um, meters. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. what, what had happened back in 2005, 2006 is there was a couple of companies that came out with meters that were lower priced. Prior to 2005, 2006, the meters themselves were $1,500 to $2,500 even for the low end ones because mm -hmm. there just wasn't enough volume enough market to justify the price. And so um, a couple of companies came out with meters that started um, – developing higher volume, better quality, and as a result of that, the, the cost came way, way down. And so that we saw that the, the opportunity for software to match the essentially the cost of the what we call affordable meters um, mm -hmm. started happening about 2006 and 2007 as well. But, uh, okay, so but when the, when the cost came down so dramatically, um, 
uh, when you buy a really low cost meter, like a two hundred dollar meter, are are you getting the kind of accuracy that would uh, allow you to calibrate a TV uh, reasonably well, or is there a wide margin of error in the measurements that you'll get from a very low end meter? In the early uh, inexpensive meters, there was a wide margin. Um, back in 2006, 2007, the low-cost meters would only get you to about 80, 85 percent of what the, the higher-end professional-level meters were costing. Um, but with these days, uh, both companies, there's a number of companies out there that have made a lot of advancements in colorimeter technology, measurement technology, including the quality of the filters, the quality of the sensors that are in the, the meters themselves. And that difference is getting smaller and smaller as, as the years go on. And now the lower end low cost meters um, are probably the equivalent to about 90 to 95 percent of what we can do with the with the higher end meters. Wow. Wow. Well, that is pretty good. Um, oh, it's, yes. Uh, I was going to say uh, ICV ran in the chat room asked uh, that uh, asks that he recently bought a uh, Samsung D6450. How can I calibrate it? Um, and the answer in this particular forum right now is use Calman. <laughs> <laughs> well, but of course, there's, there's more to it than that. <laughs> well, first off, um, to, be, to, to do a calibration, you have to be an enthusiast because there is, there is a learning curve. You have to, um, on our forums or other popular forums out on the, on the for, uh, web, you have to kind of learn the background of how video is produced, how it works, how it's transmitted. Um, but there's a lot of good information, and then we we tried to make CalMan as simple and as easy it is to use, and it's what we call workflow based. And so the idea is you plug in your hardware, you start up CalMan, and we walk you through step by step on what you need to do to initialize the meter, if you're going to be generating patterns, how to set those up, and then we start walking you through what we call our visual steps for calibration: brightness, contrast, color, temp, sharpness. Mm -hmm. um, those are all done visually, and but we, we help you bring up the correct patterns and explain what those patterns are supposed to be doing. And then we get into the, uh, the measurement side of it. We're actually measuring gamut, grayscale, and gamma. Well, that, this brings up an excellent point that I wanted to uh, touch upon, which is you have the basic user controls that you mentioned, um, contrast, brightness, color, tint, and sharpness. And... Anybody can set those on their TV without any kind of meter as long as you have certain types of test patterns, which you can get on uh, inexpensive discs like the Spears and Munsill uh, High Definition Benchmark or the Joe Kane uh, D, uh, Digital Video Essentials or uh, even the Disney Wow Disc. Um, and that gets you a certain way towards the best possible picture that any display can produce. And then if you want to go farther, you need to get uh, a meter and you need to go through that process that you were just alluding to, uh, whereby you actually measure things and adjust things even further. Now, I want to ask you the question, how far can you get typically? I know it varies from set to set, but generally speaking, how far can you get by just adjusting those basic user controls as opposed to going the full calibration route with a meter and all that jazz? The visual steps get you about 70% of what a display is capable of. So it's actually a big percentage of the calibration process. Even the professional mm -hmm. calibrators, those first five steps, the brightness, contrast, color, tint, sharpness, um, are still done visually. Our eyes are excellent at determining uh, for those settings and the appropriate test patterns, whether they be a pattern generator or a calibration disk or something you downloaded and ran from your PC. Um, mm -hmm. So about 70%. And then we start getting into measurement side of things. Um, and then the first couple of steps in measurement get us about another 20%. And then the fine little tweaking portions of the measurement get us that last 5 or 10%. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, of course, enthusiasts are going to want that last 5 or 10%, no question. But the, but the question becomes, in my mind, uh, at least for those who don't have golden eyes, <laughs> those who really see tiny little differences, how important is that last 5 or 10%? I mean, will people be able to see it? Um, that last 5 or 10%, it's getting harder and harder to see. The display technology is getting better every day. Mm -hmm. um, 
But the biggest difference between the visual portion of the calibration where we're setting brightness and contrast and we, the first steps of measurements where we're actually measuring the gamma curve and the white balance, mm -hmm. our eyes are very, very easily deceived on white balance. Um, a good example of that is if anybody is into digital photography, you know, you set your camera up for auto white balance and the camera kind of tries to figure out what the white balance is, um, it often gets white balance wrong. Our mm -hmm. eyes adapt to that white balance and even though the camera said, I'm going to set a white balance and it's slightly red, if our eyes are looking at it, we'll still think that it's white. Um, and so that's the biggest reason for instrumentation is primarily for setting white balance. Now, give us a quick definition of white balance for those who might not understand that term. On, on televisions today, um, the signal is breaking down and broken down into a couple of different parts. We have essentially the black and white signal that comes into the television, and then we have the color signal that goes on top of that. Uh, the white balance that we're talking about is making sure that the black and white signal, the white in the black and white signal is truly a neutral white and not shifted towards blue or towards red. Some mm -hmm. examples here that, uh, that Scott has up here. You know, we can see on the left hand side, um, you know, it's too red. On the right hand side, the flesh tones are more natural. Um, and then again on the bottom with the, the white scenes um, to where we've got contrast that's washed out. We've got a more looking, more natural looking contrast on the right. Often what happens is the display manufacturers ship their displays with a very, very blue looking white point. And so the whites look very blue. The reason they do this is it makes the TVs perceive, be, to be perceived brighter and put mm -hmm. out more light. Mm -hmm. Especially, Especially on the showroom floor when they're having to compete with a bunch of TVs right next door. Yes, we call it torch mode or, sto or storeroom short demo mode. Um, you walk down a big box store and they've got 30 displays side by side. The manufacturers know the TV that's the brightest, the biggest, and the most colorful will sell more. And so the manufacturers compete with each other to make their TVs um, brighter, more colorful. And those are way outside the standards. And so the goal when we get a television home is to go back to what we call director's intent what was the director viewing when he was editing the material in his production suites? Mm -hmm. He does it on calibrated displays that are calibrated to the standards. He does it in a room that has subdued lighting and has ambient lighting, ambient lighting that's properly managed. And so we're trying to reproduce that environment that the director was viewing his critical material on in his environment. Right. I've, I've always often said that uh, this is one reason why else LED, LCD TVs typically are now selling so much better than plasmas because on the showroom floor, LCD TVs have the ability to pump out a bunch more light than plasmas do. And so they look brighter and people go, oh, that's brighter. I'll get that one. Well, there are advantages of both uh, television technologies. Um, there is for the newer LCD, LED based TVs, if you're going to be putting a TV into a room that has a lot of lighting during the day or a lot of lighting on at night, you know, you're competing with ambient light, then that's mm -hmm. probably a better choice for those environments. If you're using it for gaming or you have windows that are facing the display, you're getting a lot of light off the display. Um, and LCD, LED based TV is probably a better choice. If you're looking for television that you can use more in a home theater environment where you can control the ambient lighting or bring the shades down or make sure that uh, you don't have windows that are reflecting off the display, then the uh, plasmas are typically a better choice because they have better blacks and they have better color saturation. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Midnight Rider in the chat room asks, is it possible for a person who is partially colorblind to use CalMan to do calibrations? That is an interesting question because myself, I am partially colorblind. I'm right deficient. Really? In I'm, I'm partially red deficient in my right eye, um, which is kind of interesting. If I look through either eye, reds look different to me. Wow. Uh, and so that is another reason why we need to use instrumentation for setting our white balance. Because um, a person that is partially red deficient in one or both eyes um, is much, much harder to, to set up the white balance. And with instrumentation, um, it knows exactly what it's looking at. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd say a person that's partially colorblind could still set the um, brightness, contrast, brightness and contrast anyway. I'm not sure about color and tint. What do you think? Um, color and tint, yes, as well. Um, 
we teach people for setting color intent uh, to use blue only mode, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. a lot of the televisions, the manufacturers, we've been working with display manufacturers for the last three or four years to start including advanced calibration capabilities in the displays without having to go into a service menu. Um, they started uh, doing that for us a number of years ago and making that, that process easier. Um, and so in blue only mode, essentially what happens is we put up a, a, a blue cyan magenta white pattern and then we have you adjust the television color and tint, but we put the TV in blue only mode so it's essentially filtering out all the other colors. So even somebody that is even fully colorblind can still see a difference when it's in blue only mode. Mm. I wish more TVs had a blue only mode um, uh, because uh, the other option is looking through uh, what, what are blue filters, basically a, a gel that you put over your eyes and it filters blue. Only it, it allows only blue light to come through and hit your eye. But the problem with that is it can be very inaccurate, especially with LCD TVs. Yes, the blue filters are typically our last choice. Um, that's essentially the last go-to. Mm -hmm. um, the filters themselves um, typically don't have a real high quality control on them. So even from lot to lot, they're different. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on how somebody sees color, you know, if they are partially color deficient, um, that'll affect it. And then also with LCD, we get cross-channel leakage between the, between the primaries. And so even if you're supposed to only be seeing blue, you get a lot of red and green as well. Um, and so the blue filters are less likely to give you the correct result than blue only mode. And a lot of the manufacturers know this. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the 2012 models from most of the popular display manufacturers have a blue only mode. Oh, that's great news. Um, yes, we've yeah. been able to... Um, and yeah, every year uh, we're working with display manufacturers, usually about this time each year. Um, they're getting ready for their following year's um, technology. You know, they'll start showing them at CES and then shipping sometime in the spring. And mm -hmm. so we're working with engineering groups out of most of the, the larger display companies for producing next year's televisions. They usually get us involved in that process somewhere towards the tail end to make sure that um, you know, the controls they're putting in are correct, that Calman has control over the display in various interfaces, and that, uh, you know, we have opportunity to, to do firmware tweaks before it shows up at CES. Now, that's, uh, you make a very good point there about uh, uh, Calman being able to interface with some of these TVs. I know Panasonic now has this capability where you can connect your computer to the TV, run Calman, and it will um, automatically do the calibration. You, you hook up a meter to it as well, and you basically just hit go, and, and the TV talks to the software, and the software talks to the TV, and sets it up and, and does the calibration essentially automatically. Are you saying that other manufacturers are now starting to include that in their TVs? Oh, absolutely. We've been working with Panasonic, um, and then prior to that, Pioneer, um, before Panasonic acquired a lot of the technologies from for about three years, to four years. Mm -hmm. uh, Panasonic started working with us directly, um, the engineering group out of Japan. I have direct access to them at Panasonic for what we call our direct display controller, DDC. The concept behind it is similar to what people do for audio calibration that we've kind of just taken for granted now. Um, I was saying originally my background in audio back in the 80s, 90s, um, where you bring in two speakers, you bring in equipment, you do a bunch of test sounds and set up the acoustics and you know delays and levels. Um, and then as more and more manufacturers started coming out with automated audio calibration where you put a mic in the center of the room, um, they started getting better and better. Basically press a single button and the, and the audio system calibrates itself. Um, if your room is fairly neutral for acoustics, those tools actually work pretty well. Um, mm -hmm. But unfortunately, most people's rooms for, for acoustics are usually nightmares and so those tools mm -hmm try to do the best that they can, but there's usually a lot of acoustical treatments that, that rooms need. Um, so we started seeing the opportunity for video going the same way. Uh, it, the ability to talk to a display directly, um, we do that with all the video processor manufacturers. In fact, they were the, the first ones to, we started working with. So the products from Lumigen, the products from DVDO, and the products from AV Foundry um, gave us the ability to essentially talk to the hardware via Calman and make adjustments on essentially a closed loop, closed loop system. We demonstrated this to Panasonic a couple of years ago, 
Um, they said, we want to be the first company to provide an automated calibration interface. And so we showed that this last spring at the Panasonic dealer show in London in February. Mm -hmm. And everybody got really excited about it. And since then, we've been contacted by a number of other display manufacturers providing the same interface. Um, the other one that we can talk about, JVC, the projector manufacturer. Um, this year's models, last year's models, we have full control over. Um, we just got in all the new Sharp Elites. Uh, in fact, we just got one, I believe, showed up last Friday. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. um, we're already well underway of, of getting support for all the Sharp displays in as well. And right. then the right. manufacturers we're under NDA with at the moment. Um, we can't talk about it until they're actually ready. Understood. But there's a long list of hardware that shows up at our shipping dock every week. <laughs> um, a dog sandwich in the chat room asks a great question. How do you calibrate for the difference between input devices? Uh, live TV, DVD, Apple TV, Blu-ray, and so on. Obviously, DVD and Blu-ray you can do with a disc. But how do you do it for uh, you know, a satellite box or over-the-air TV? That is a great question. We often get this. Um, so for display calibration, you have to start with a known source. And so we typically recommend that you start with a, either a pattern generator or a Blu-ray disc to calibrate your input to get the TV to a known calibration state. And then you start hooking up your different inputs. Um, and unfortunately, for you know, Apple TV or streaming devices over Blu-ray, um, over DVD, um, or even over the air, it's, it's kind of a crapshoot as to what you get. Um, even from channel to channel, uh, some of the, I've seen some of the television stations will broadcast signals that are very different from each other. And so you kind of have to bring up known material um, and kind of eyeball it after that. But at least your display is to a neutral point. So your white balance is neutral, your gamma curve is neutral, and then essentially you're just adjusting a small amount of brightness and contrast and color and tint. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have HDNet, they often will broadcast a set of test patterns like early Sunday morning. Um, I've got it recorded on my DVR. I've had it there for the last couple of years. So anytime I need to calibrate for my DVR, I can just grab the HDNet patterns and, and run those. But an interesting point is, and in fact, I, I can say that we're working with a very large set-top box manufacturer to actually include patterns in the DVR itself. In fact, now, that's why I was last week at, at their research lab working with them, and it should be announced a little bit later this fall when that's going to be available. Mm. Now, I know that THX was working with TiVo to put the THX optimizer patterns onto the TiVo Premiere, I believe it was, or maybe still is. So that's one example of exactly what you're talking about. Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. So uh, I, I can only hope that we continue to see that happen because I would love to see set-top boxes, satellite receivers, and, uh, and so on, uh, have setup patterns in them that let you at least set the uh, brightness and contrast, color and tint um, for that particular source. Yes, it's becoming more and more popular. Um, for us, that project started a little over two years ago um, in Sky TV Brazil, their subsidiary of DirecTV. Um, they first started offering their high definition satellite services um, two years ago, and they wanted to offer a premium service so that if you bought, if you had a high definition television and you bought their high definition satellite service, they would come in and calibrate the television for you for free as part mm. of that service. Nice. And they wanted to minimize what the technicians had to carry or could lose in the field. <laughs> and so we worked with them to essentially have all the patterns downloaded to the satellite set-top box. And so they essentially needed an inexpensive netbook, a colorimeter, and then Calman running on it. And they plug everything in, and they can do a calibration in about 15 minutes with this system as, mm. as a premium offering. Um, there are a number of... Uh, providers in the U.S. that are looking at similar options. Mm -hmm. um, high score in the, uh, in the chat room. You mentioned uh, technology being acquired uh, by Panasonic from Pioneer. And he says, what technology did Panasonic acquire from Pioneer? Pioneer used Panasonic panels. Well, yes, that's true. 
But uh, uh, when Pioneer got out of the TV business, basically, uh, I think Panasonic acquired their intellectual property, right? Yes, it was kind of interesting how, how it played out. Panasonic acquired their intellectual property and most of the engineering group that did the firmware interface for the Pioneer, you know, the, the C3 interface for controlling the, the display via serial port. Mm -hmm. And then Sharp acquired a number of engineers that did the video processing side of it. And that's essentially where they came up with the Sharp Elite um, with Pioneer. And so Pioneer kind of divvied up all of their, their intellectual property to the two groups. And now they're competing groups. We've got uh, Sharp and Panasonic competing against each other with similar technologies they've licensed originally. <laughs> uh, Floop in the chat room asks, uh, can, can all modern TVs produce an undithered 8 bits per color? It's no, they can't. Um, and what happens is uh, plasma and LCD both suffer from this. At the bottom end, when the signal gets fairly dark, they usually have to start doing some form of dithering to get a better black. Um, plasma does this. They, they switch their modulation modes at the bottom end, and LCD does this as well. So, uh, and dithering, by the way, is, is just uh, basically it's kind of adding some noise, if I'm not mistaken, into the low end signal, into the dark signal, so that there's not such a big difference between one bit turning on and off. Am I correct on that? That is correct. Either they, they turn the bit on and off at a faster rate, or they change the modulation to give you additional perceived steps of black, even though they don't really exist. Right. Okay. Um, and uh, Uzi Galil asks, and I think you answered this before, but I'll just make, make reiterate the point. Why don't TVs ship calibrated? Um, that is a great question. A um, couple of reasons. The display manufacturers want their television, well, the whole purpose for display manufacturers is sell televisions. I mean, that's their only purpose. Right. And so they know in order to sell televisions, their televisions have to look different. And they know to make them look different, they make them brighter or more colorful. And so they ship from the factory that way. Um, but we do have movie modes and uh, cinema modes and theater modes in televisions. And so they do understand that when you get the television home, you don't want to watch something that's essentially going to burn your retinas out. Yeah, and, you're going to have to wear dark glasses. Yeah, so often what they do is they give us these theater modes, but usually all the theater mode does is just reduce the overall light output of the television. It doesn't necessarily put it into a calibrated mode. Um, and then also talking with the display manufacturers, their goal is profits, and they get about 45 seconds on the uh, manufacturing line to calibrate a television, which isn't <laughs> much time. And so the tolerances are fairly wide. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. from television to television, you, you, know, you know, if you bought 100 televisions and measured them all, you may find the one that was the sweet spot that essentially was more or less calibrated from the factory, but the other 98 on other side of it, on either side of it, um, is kind of, uh, you know, kind of random because it's fairly wide tolerances on, on what they let go out the door. Mm. Uh, so Cal Ray Jr. in the chat room, our friend Ray, um, who I know you know, uh, yes. asks, what is SpectraCal doing as far as calibration training? Oh, great question. Um, one of the things that we found, we started providing software a number of years ago. Um, in order for people to buy software, they want to buy hardware and they want to buy it from a single source, and so we started providing bundled packages. Um, but then we also found people were very interested in training. And so a year and a half ago, we started a training program um, where it's essentially a one-day class. We call it our Pro Monitor Calibration class. And we travel to cities all across the U.S. to essentially the people that are interested in this technology. We do at least one class a week. I know we've got probably three or four going on this week in uh, the California area where Ray is from. Um, and so the goal with that is for a few hundred dollars, if somebody is truly interested in it at either an enthusiast level or even beyond enthusiasts are looking at, uh, you know, looking at it for additional income or if they're an installer to start providing additional services, it's basically a one-day primer where we just um, get them hands-on. We go through all of the theory. Um, as far as what they need for calibration and, you know, what the equipment is. The room's full of all different types of equipment so they can play with, you know, essentially from the low-end low, low end equipment all the way to the high-end equipment. Um, just kind of immerse them in the, the, that technology. Mm. 
Excellent. And uh, Dr. T in the chat room uh, pointed to the uh, URL for that for more information on that, which is store.spectrical.com slash training dot html so yeah. uh, you can you can go to spectrical.com and find the, the training page i'm sure um here's a great question from uzi galil uh once calibrated does a tv need recalibration once in a while or does it hold um we typically recommend that you you check up the tv about every six months um tvs do drift over time um this was more of a problem in the CRT days because phosphors aged at different rates. Red phosphor mm -hmm. aged faster than the other colors, and so you'd get a red. Your your red would be deficient over time. Mm -hmm. uh, projectors suffer from this as the lamps age; they become red deficient as well. Um, plasmas they're phosphor based, so over time red will become deficient, but it's usually much broader time. Mm -hmm. And um, LCDs, if they're CCFL backlight. That CCFL lamp is also phosphor-based, so reds will be deficient. Um, and then also LED. Our, our white LED TVs use yellow phosphor on an ultra-blue LED to produce reds, and that yellow phosphor will also decay over time. So even with the most modern digital technologies we've got, um, they will drift over time. And so typically every six months you break out the equipment you just validate that it's that if there is some drift you've corrected for it but it's usually small small tweaks with the modern mm -hmm. great well <clears throat> before we continue uh, i do want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode netflix now most of our audience of course knows netflix um i have netflix uh, streaming i'm sure most of you listening to this podcast have netflix streaming uh my wife and i were just watching some documentaries the, the other night and uh you know the quality is surprisingly good uh for being pretty highly compressed uh there's a ton of uh, of options and things you can get on netflix uh, which delivers movies and tv episodes to your home directly saving you time money and hassle you can instantly watch thousands of uh, TV episodes and movies streamed directly to your PC or Mac or directly to your TV uh, if it's Netflix enabled, and most TVs are these days. Uh, your game uh, console, Xbox 360, PS3, Nintendo Wii, uh, Blu-ray players, uh, just about anything you can buy that has anything to do with video these days uh, has uh, Netflix app on it that uh, lets you do this uh, streaming um, and you can watch as many movies and TV episodes as you want anytime you want uh, there's never any late fees certainly no due dates you can even start watching on one device and finish watching on another um, so be sure to sign up for your free trial at Netflix uh, which they are offering to twit uh, listeners and we're very uh, grateful for that. Uh, you can sign up at netflix.com slash twit and be sure to use that URL netflix.com slash twit and we sure thank Netflix for their support of the twit network and home theater geeks. So um, let's see here Derek um, we've been talking a lot about um, calibration, and rightly so, because it's uh, a very interesting subject for us geeks, and I think we're all geeks on this bus. Um, but I wanted to make sure we spent some time on... Oh, before we get there, <laughs> I just remembered. You had mentioned that, that uh, there are some plans in the works for where Calman might be going, and I don't want to forget to mention that. What can you tell us about the future of Calman? Um, as we found, the, the core of CalMAN is essentially dealing with video calibration for flat panel displays, digital displays, and more and more technologies are going to that. Um, medical, industrial, signage, PCs, and so we're uh, actively developing products in a number of other areas. Um, we're not abandoning our home theater roots um, by no means. But this newer technology allows us to grow the company in um, interesting ways. And a lot of that technology also comes back to the home theater products as well. So as more and more people see us uh, develop products for these other industries, um, don't worry that, you know, we're not going to abandon our home theater roots. Um, in, sac in fact, that's, that's where we come from. And we're taking a lot of that technology to these other industries. Excellent. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, when I was at Cedia, 
I, I did. I missed you. I guess uh, you weren't there at the same at the booth the same moment I was, but I did see L.A., so that was great. Um, and I saw something really interesting there: a new video processor that uh, you are at least marketing. I'm not sure exactly what your relationship is. You can help uh, clue me in on that uh, with a company called EE Color. And, uh, and they have a new video processor that looked very interesting. Why don't you tell us something about that? The EE Color Box, which I've got one here, you may not be able to see very well um, in the video here. I can hold it up. Um, yeah. There's the front panel, and then the back panel is essentially HDMI in, HDMI out, um, and provides um, color correction beyond what we've been able to do with traditional video processors. How the technology has worked out is our goal with video processors initially were to scale, process, switch. And then we started working with DVDO and Lumigen a number of years ago and said, you've got all this processing power. Why not provide us the ability to be able to control the output of it, essentially calibrate externally? Um, this is very popular in the Hollywood market. They use all kinds of very, very expensive gear to do this. And so we wanted to bring this to the, to the home market as well. And so we worked again with uh, Lumigen DVDO and AV Foundry about providing calibration capability from the hardware. So the goal is you calibrate your display to the best of its abilities. And if the display doesn't have all the controls or doesn't have all the range of controls that you need, which is still fairly popular today, then we can use external hardware to, to manage that. Um, then from there, we can um, calibrate the display externally. With the EE image processor, it's taking it one step further. And when we brought this product to Cedia, we were concerned that we were going outside of our, our essentially our calibration roots. We're telling people we want to calibrate to standards. We want to have director's intent. But as I pointed out previously, director's intent and how the directors view material is in a room that is essentially calibrated itself. It has very specific requirements for the lighting, how much light hits the screen, the types of lighting, you know, whether it's tungsten or fluorescence. And often it's difficult to, to reproduce that lighting environment in your home, you know, unless you turn the lights off, which a lot of people don't anymore with, with essentially these large panels. Right. And also, and also if you, as long as you have uh, dark, neutral colored walls, a lot of people have, watch TV in, in white rooms, essentially, which is another problem. Oh, yeah, white rooms or their furniture is brightly colored. or Yeah, there's, there's just a lot of things that, that make it difficult to reproduce the environment that the director was viewing his material on. And what we found is we say, okay, we calibrate your television, and usually the first complaint we get from people after the television, television is calibrated is they watch it in a darkened room, and the material looks great. That's essentially what the director was looking at. But then they turn the lights on, or they watch TV during the day, um, and usually their first comment is the colors look washed out. Well, the colors didn't change, how we see colors changed. It's mm -hmm. called visual perception. And as the room brightness increases, as, as we have more ambient lighting, our eyes see colors differently. And so in order to deal with that, uh, you need a fairly amount of advanced color processing. And we were working with the guys from Entertainment Experience, um, RIT, and also Kodak on visual perception models. And RIT the, is the uh, Rensselaer Institute of Technology? The uh, Rochester. Rochester, sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, and they've got a lot of advanced uh, research technologies coming out of there. And they've been seeing this problem for a number of years. Um, as, as brightness goes up, our room brightness goes up, we see colors less saturated. So the goal is to provide calibration capabilities no matter what the room environment is. And so if we've got a room with lights on and we switch the box, uh, the image processor into that particular mode, it knows that it has to increase color saturation for our primaries, but it also knows that I can't just start moving flesh tones around. Flesh tones still have to look neutral. Um, and so it does a, essentially a, a dynamic job of how it's going to deal with uh, ambient lighting conditions and visual perception. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of the next level of calibration for us 
in that we're starting to deal with how people actually watch TVs now. We're not dictating that you have to turn your lights off and you can only watch them in a very darkened room. That's obviously the ideal situation, but that doesn't happen often or isn't is happening less and less. And <laughs> not so in the real world anyway, yeah. Yeah, and so we're providing hardware that deals with these creative lighting situations. It, it's a very interesting idea and uh, one that, as you said, depends upon... Uh, what are often called human factor studies that uh, I think uh, the RIT and uh, various companies have taken people into rooms and shown them images and, and taken a lot of data and, and all of this data is then averaged in some way and incorporated into this box. Have I got that right? No, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And essentially the box is a video processor on steroids or an image processor on steroids. It's got a ton of memory that we load down, we download all the tables to. Um, it's essentially HDMI in, HDMI out. Um, and so if anybody is familiar with essentially the, the video Forge or the video EQ product that we have from AV Foundry um, that had calibration capability, this is essentially kind of the next generation of that to where we have uh, 3D lookup tables on the input so we can load these visual perception models in. Now, uh, when you say 3D lookup tables, you don't mean 3D as in 3D images, right? That is, yes, that is confusing. Um, when we talk about 3D, it's, it can be one of two things. We've got 3D images, um, you know, for 3D color or 3D televisions. And then 3D color processing um, essentially deals with color in a three-dimensional space. And so we know that if green comes in at a certain color, depending on what the brightness of green is, we can adjust that to work with the visual perception models in a three, a full three-dimensional space. Right, right, right. right. So, so we just want to make sure that when we're talking about 3D lookup tables and 3D processing, we're not talking about 3D imagery. Correct. Although, now, although the EE image processor does um, process 3D imagery as well. Um, it supports side-by-side -side and top-bottom. Mm -hmm. And so it's compatible with the, the current uh, standards that people are using today. Well, that, oh, uh, uh, Midnight Rider in the chat room asks, what's the cost of this box? Um, I believe it's about $1,800. Um, i would have to go back and look. I'm, I'm the technology guy. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the marketing guy. Oh, there we go, $1,600. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, often when I go to trade shows, you know, I'll be helping in the booth and people start asking me questions about pricing. I'm like, I, I have to grab one of the sales guys. I can answer all the technical questions, but um, I try to stay out of the pricing stuff. Right. <laughs> well, um, often I'm wrong. And so I, I typically won't, like I said, it was 1800 and it's in fact 1695. So. Okay. So you were, you were close. You were in the ballpark. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're talking about 3D, actually, one, I wanted to bring up the, the, the um, notion of 3D imagery and how you calibrate a 3D display for 3D, which, as I've found and my partner Tom Norton has found here at hometheater.com, uh, it turns out to be pretty tricky. Well, there's a number of things we have to consider. Um, the, the first thing is when you put a TV in a 3D mode, it usually changes the dynamics of the television completely. In fact, they have to be calibrated separately. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing that happens if you're using a active shutter system where you put on the glasses and they've got the LCD shutters open and closing in sync with the television, the fact of that happening is the, li the light that's coming to your eyes is only half of what the television is putting out. and so Or, or even less because the glasses or, you're, or the glasses are... Uh, preventing some light from getting to either eye. They're, they're simply filtering quite a bit. I've heard numbers on the order of uh, active glasses can filter as much as 75% yes. of the light reaching your eyes. Uh, passive uh, filters somewhat less, may, maybe more like, more like 50%. Right. And so the manufacturers know this. So when you put a TV into 3D mode, a couple of things are going to happen is the manufacturer is going to drive the TV as hard as they possibly can and make it put out as much light as they possibly can. And we know in torch mode, the manufacturers make the whites look very blue um, to get a lot of light or perceived light output. And if you look at your active glasses and pick them up and look through them, they look yellow. And that is for a reason, because if you add blue and yellow together, you get something that's closer to white. Mm. Uh, so... 
we run into a problem where the manufacturers are driving the displays right to the limit. They're driving them blue. And so to counteract that, when we go into calibrate a display in 3D mode, um, we have to take those into consideration. Also, the consideration you have is what glasses are you using? Are you using the glasses that came from the manufacturer? Are you using a third-party glass glasses? Um, are they the same color yellow as, mm -hmm. the manu as what the manufacturer intended? I've even seen a manufacturer of last year's glasses to this year's glasses used a different color yellow because they didn't have to drive the television as hard this year, and so they were able to get a little, little bit more light through the glasses themselves by not making them as yellow. Wow, so if, if you used last year's glasses with this year's TV, it wouldn't look right. That is correct, or not, it, it's, it's more difficult to calibrate. And so, right. just as we were talking about doing uh, color and tint with a blue filter, you know, the blue filters, who knows, you know, what the, what the QA was on those, we run into the same problems with glasses. You grab a mm -hmm. dozen glasses mm -hmm. from various manufacturers over different model years, and they're gonna look different. And uh, now, in terms of calibrating uh, 3D TVs, do you actually, what we found is we, we actually put the glasses, one of the lenses, over the uh, sensor of the meter in order to give the meter a sense of what's actually reaching the eye. Is that what you guys do as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, we take uh, one of our meters and we put it on the other side of the glasses, which is also a tricky thing to do because... A lot of these glasses are uh, based on IR, and so they can't be too close to the display. They need to be back a couple of feet so that the IR signal sees the glasses and the glasses go into active shutter mode. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so you need to put the meter in front of the glasses, but the glasses need to be as close to the TV as you can get and, and uh, still stay in active shutter mode. Well, now that's for, that's for uh, meters. Uh, cer certain meters are designed to actually be placed up against the screen of the TV, whereas others can be placed back uh, away from the TV and pointed at the TV. But am I not correct that the, the ones that are meant to be in contact with the TV, what are sometimes called puck style uh, meters, are the less expensive ones generally? Well, no, and typically they are. The, the contact meter or puck style meter um, typically don't have any optics, and that's one of the areas they can save money on where if you have to pull the meter back from the display even just a few feet, uh, they typically have to put some sort of optics in front of the sensors, and that obviously adds cost depending on the quality of the optics. Right. Mm -hmm. So in, in the case of the puck or contact style meter, you might not be able to calibrate with the glasses at all. Um, typically, we recommend that you don't. Uh, one of the meters that we sell, the, um, the X-Rite i1 Pro, which is the, the low-cost uh, spectra radiometer, Mm -hmm. um, has, does have optics. Um, it's got a, a field of view that's about seven degrees. And so even if you're about three feet back from the television, you're only seeing maybe about 12 inches across um, from three feet back. And so that's, that's the one meter that we recommend that people use if they're going to be doing 3D calibration. Mm -hmm. And how much is that meter? Uh, it's, I think it's right around $1,000. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so it, you know, uh, it ain't cheap. It's not much compared to... Uh, you know the ten or fifteen thousand dollar meters, but you know it's still for an enthusiast. An enthusiast better be a serious enthusiast <laughs> to spend a thousand dollars on a meter just to do their own TV and maybe their parents or whatever. You'd be surprised. Um, well, often what happens is an enthusiast is an enthusiast. They've always got the latest gear, fairly cutting edge, um, and so they're swapping out display technologies once every year or two years. They're swapping out source devices, processors, switchers, receivers. Um, and so the investment in the calibration gear um, goes a long way if you're changing out stuff quite often. Mm, yeah, I'm sure that's true. Um, and then, then there's the issue of calibrating separately for 3D, which not all TVs let you do. Um, that is true. Um, some of the TVs, when they go into 3D mode, that's it. It's 3D mode and you can't make any adjustments and you're just kind of stuck with what it is. And that would be a reason to use an external processor. Um, whether it be a Lumigen or a DVD or a Video EQ or now even the the, the um, EE image processor. But again, those those processors that you're talking about, uh, a lot of the most of them aren't cheap either. No, they're not. Um, the they start from anywhere you know from right around a thousand dollars up to about four thousand mm dollars. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, 
to, to finish up here, we've got about 10 minutes left, and I wanted to ask you um, where you see the video market going in the future. Um, there's uh, is 3D here to stay? I'm <laughs> <laughs> Let's start there, shall we? <laughs> I hear a lot of probably unqualified rumors um, from, from a lot of industry experts. And th you can probably read the latest statements from Sony and the cinema manufacturer, the cinema providers. Um, you know, Sony just announced they're no longer going to subsidize the the passive glasses that go into these theaters. Um, so the kind of the handwriting's on the wall that that uh, you know the the plug is starting to be pulled at the at the theater level. Um, which if if that starts to happen, then the companies that are producing movies will be less interested because they don't see the profits from it. Um, so I see that it's starting to unwind a bit for movies. Mm. The one area that I see that'll probably continue to take off and most likely drive the industry will probably be sports. Um, people like watching sports on their TV in 3D mode. Um, so I, th I think that'll probably drive the industry more. Um, you know, if you look at television sales, when do most high definition television sales happen each year? It's right before the Super Bowl. Right. Uh, and so as more and more uh, sports are broadcast in 3D, then I think that'll probably be the, the driving part for home theater, for commercial. Um, as I was saying, I just, I just see what I'm reading from, you know, statements like Sony and other companies where they're starting to pull the plug on some of it. Mm. I just I just heard also that uh, the Olympics uh, next year are going to be broadcast much of them in 3D. So uh, that also supports your notion that uh, sports may be the driving factor uh, in 3D in the home. Um, but uh, to tell you the truth, I actually hadn't read that uh, Sony piece yet, which is kind of discouraging for the theater market. That's for sure. Yeah, I believe it was uh, last week that I saw on one of the the tech forums or um, from on one of the news feeds that I get. But uh, uh, Sony's no longer going to sponsor the the uh, the glasses, and and how that industry worked out um, is the the cinema owners didn't actually have to pay anything for the gear. Um, there were investments groups that came in and were basically hedging their bets on um, 3D technology, and hence the reason why when you go in to watch a 3D movie, you pay that extra bit. That didn't really go to the theaters. It didn't go to the cinema. Um, providers, uh, operators that typically went to these investment groups. And oh, so, the, the extra money for uh, the higher price, ticket price for 3D movies didn't go to the theaters or the uh, studios, huh? Yeah, a less percentage of that. It was primarily going to the investments group that, that put in the, the 3D projectors and you know, were managing all the equipment. Mm, mm. Well, what else can we expect in the future of the video market uh, if you look into your crystal ball? There's some interesting technology that's coming out. Um, well, one of the things that we've been preaching is, you know, the display manufacturers have been providing televisions that have a lot more color or what's called a wider color gamut. Mm -hmm. And for the last five or six years, we've been saying, no, 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 no. We want to turn all that off. We want to calibrate everything back to the standards. That's what uh, I've always said. Well, that's, that's what we've been preaching. And now with the EE image processor, we can actually utilize that larger color gamut depending on room lighting. And so now we want to encourage the manufacturers to support providing wider and bigger gamuts. Um, one of the interesting things is convergence of technology. You know, if you go back five to eight years ago, was the PC going to be the central um, piece for a home theater or viewing, or was it the television? And if we look at our televisions today, they don't require a PC. They have, they're fully network connected. They stream. They run apps. You can download apps. You can hook up your exercise equipment, your gaming uh, controllers, play games on them. So the TV themselves has essentially become the, the home theater computer. Um, and as that technology continues to evolve, the TV itself is the, is the central repository for where all your streaming comes in, where your storage is. Um, in fact, in Europe, Panasonic has the ability on their European televisions, you can plug in a hard drive and the TV becomes its own DVR. Mm. Um, so I think that's one direction that televisions are going to go. As that technology starts to converge and more and more people are getting into digital photography, you want to be able to just view your, your pictures on your television. You don't want to have to bring it on your laptop. You know, you have family over and you essentially have your, you know, your, you bring out all your, uh, 
pictures and you're going to show them, you know, essentially your clipbook. Um, if the television supports the Adobe RGB gamut, which is very, very wide, then you can start shooting with your digital photography in RGB or Adobe RGB gamut and see it in native um, Adobe RGB, which is phenomenal looking. And so yeah. we're going to the display manufacturers start providing televisions that have even a much wider, bigger gamut than we have today. And I must admit, uh, I, I, like you, preached for a long time that, no, we want to stick with the uh, Rec. 709 color gamut. But uh, when I saw at, I went up to Runco and I visited them and they showed me some uh, films, some movies on an expanded color gamut, but with the flesh tones corrected. And I was very impressed with that. I didn't think I would be, but I was. And I think the EE Color does this as well. You mentioned that earlier. It keeps the flesh tones where they're supposed to be while expanding the rest of the colors out and, uh, and giving you a more saturated look. Yes. In fact, I do have one of those Runco projectors. I've got a 750, um, which has what they call their, I think it was called their True Color, um, yeah. where they fully, fully utilize the color gamut of the LED projector itself but then still manage flesh tones so, so they look net, uh, neutral and natural. So that's yeah. kind of the beginnings or the example of what the EE image processor can do. Um, the, the true color managed flesh tones. The EE image processor gives us the ability to manage a lot of other earth tones as well. There's a lot of other visual um, earth tones that we key off of for natural whites and natural flesh tones. Mm -hmm. And so well, we can expand the color gamut. We can also go inverse of that. If you have, for instance, like your laptop or a display that doesn't even meet the full um, capability of Rec. 709, the image processor can expand that out so flesh tones look proper even on a display that's undersaturated. Mm. So it can be expanded or contracted depending on what the technology is. Yeah, yeah. Um, one last thing about the future that I'm getting a lot of chatter in the chat room about is 4K. Now, I recently... Uh, which, is, which refers to the resolution, which is essentially four times the resolution of current HD. Um, I recently ran a poll on, on hometheater.com asking how important is 4K in the home, knowing that even when you go out to the theater and you see a screen that's 20 or 30 feet wide, you're often seeing a 2K image, which is very close to uh, home HD. And so what, where's the advantage of 4K? on that screen, much less on a screen the size that you'd find in a typical home. Are we going to see 4K displays in the home in the future? Um, they've already started doing that. There's a number of uh, projector manufacturers that are that are looking at providing 4K projectors for the home. We saw and that at I, Sony, for, with, from Sony and from JVC at Cedia, certainly. Yes. Um, but from my take, it's primarily not the resolution, it's the color gamut that 4K brings to us. Uh, really? Is 4K a different color gamut? The, the expanded color gamut, yes. Oh. Basically, digital cinema. The DCI P3 spec um, is pre pretty close or equivalent to the Adobe RGB spec. It's a much, much wider color gamut, and that's mm -hmm. what we're seeing in the theaters. And so when they produce a 4K um, in DCI, and then they produce it for the home um, for essentially 2K at, at uh, Rec. 709, we lose about a third of the color gamut and we lose about four times the resolution. Um, and as you're pointing out, depending on where you're sitting in the theater and what the lighting is, um, you may not be able to even see the 4K. So I think 4K is interesting for the home, but primarily for the expanded color gamut. Interesting. Uh, in the chat room, we're pointing out that uh, uh, Scooter X says that uh, Sony 4K projectors are at all of his local cinemas. And they are, in fact, where I live in Burbank, uh, the, the main theaters here all have Sony 4K as well. But a lot of people in the rest of the country are seeing 2K when they go to see a digital cinema. Yes. Well, let's see. Um, Beatmaster asks, do you, do you have a preference in projector technology? SXRD, <laughs> LCOS versus DLP versus LCD? I like them all. Um, basically, people often ask what I have in my own home theater, and it's, uh -huh. what, it's whatever I'm currently testing for that manufacturer. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, one question that came, uh, came up earlier, I'll finish with this. Is there a difference between um, calibrating a flat panel, a direct view TV, versus projectors? Yes, um, and it's primarily dealing with room lighting conditions, and obviously you can't put the meter directly on the 
the screen itself, so you have to pull it off. Um, and so you typically need a meter that has a some sort of optics or managed field of view. Um, and so you right. start getting right. into kind of the, the mid-priced meters opposed to the bottom end ones that were designed for flat panel. Right. But, right. but the process right. is the same. The steps are the same. Um, it's just the meter is different. Right. Fantastic. Derek, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. It's been a fascinating hour, and uh, it went by much too fast. All right. Thank you, guys. I enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Uh, you can uh, look up uh, everything the SpectraCal is doing, and it's obviously quite a lot, at SpectraCal.com. Uh, my online home, of course, is HomeTheater.com. And you can email me at Scott at Twit.tv with questions, which I answer on HomeTheater.com or uh, suggestions for guests on the podcast or anything you like. You can also follow me on Twitter at HTGeekScott. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Phil Clements, uh, the inventor of what's called H-Pass technology, which is a speaker loading technology that allows very small speakers to output much more bass than they have any right to otherwise. Uh, should be a fascinating hour, and I sure hope you'll join me for that. Until then, geek out. <laughs>